right, so this is supposed to be a quick look at James Madison and his presidency. We're really only looking at his first administration uh, from 1809 to roughly 1812. We'll talk about 1812 and what comes after later on in class. Uh, so to start with, who exactly was James Madison? Well, he had been in politics for quite a while. He was a delegate to the Second Continental Congress, but uh, at the end of the Revolutionary War, so from 1781 to 1783, uh, we know him more as being the father of the Constitution. Of course, because he was in Philadelphia at the Constitutional Convention, he worked on pretty much every aspect of the Constitution. He also co-wrote the Federalist Papers along with John Jay and Alexander Hamilton and other work with the Constitution. Uh, he was also responsible for introducing the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments to the Constitution uh, after it was ratified and the first government met. Uh, he had been a member of the House of Representatives for several years he, of course, was a co-founder of the Democratic Republican Party, along with Jefferson and uh, others who were opposed to Hamilton and his idea of expanded powers of the national government. And he was also Secretary of State for President Thomas Jefferson. Well, in 1808, Madison ran for president and was elected. And so, beginning in 1809, he becomes President of the United States. All right, so, here at home, things that are going on in his first term in office. Uh, first, we deal with the annexation of West Florida, in terms of where this is now. That's the southeastern area of Louisiana, uh, over to kind of the, the tail ends that stretch toward the Gulf of Mexico there, of uh, Mississippi and Alabama. They were owned by Spain as part, obviously, of Florida, but the United States felt that those pieces of territory had also been included with the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, we interpreted the treaty that way, even though the treaty didn't say anything about the actual area of West Florida. In 1810, after uh, a lot of dispute between us and the Spanish over uh, this piece of territory, Madison ordered the military to move into West Florida and occupy it. Later in 1812, uh, we will uh, take over a Spanish fort in Mobile and held on to that, you know, obviously uh, into, the, into the present. I mean, that's how we got West Florida. We basically took it from the Spanish. Second thing going on in James Madison's administration is an actual ongoing controversy. This thing called the Yazoo Land Deal, or Yazoo Land Deal, however you want to pronounce that. It originated uh, with Georgia. In 1794, uh, the state of Georgia sold land out in its western uh, territories for one and a half cents an acre. Let me back up real quick so you can see this map again. Okay, If you look here, this is the area we're talking about right over in here. Okay? And, you know, modern-day Georgia, of course, right here. But in 1794, this was also part of Georgia, too. Well, what happened is, in 1794, some corrupt business owners... Uh, bribed basically the entire Georgia legislature and got this really good land deal. And then, of course, started turning around and selling the land to uh, other people who didn't realize uh, how the uh, method that was used to get the original titles to the land. Well, once everything came out and everybody found out about the bribery and the scandals, uh, at the ballot box, the voters removed the corrupt legislature, and replaced them with uh, people that were, at least uh, at that time, more honest. And in 1796, the new legislature passed a law voiding the original land sale. 
In 1802, Georgia then uh, ceded all that land to the United States government, and the United States government inherited a problem with that. And the problem was who owned this land out west, because these uh, individuals and businesses that had bought that land out there, as soon as they bought it from the state of Georgia, they turned around to sell it to other people at a profit. Well, if the legislature has voided the original contract, do the people on the, the in the second sale, do they have claim to that land? Uh, technically, no, because technically the state of Georgia would still have owned that land. And so uh, the state of Georgia had been involved in a, in a contentious legal battle trying to decide, okay, who gets what money um, for the land, who deserves to be compensated. Well, there ends up being a Supreme Court case that comes out of this. It's called Fletcher versus Peck. Okay. Uh, John Peck was one of these guys that had been in the original land deal, so the 1.5 cents an acre, and he had turned around and sold it to a guy named Robert Fletcher. Fletcher sued Peck for uh, what is called breach of warranty title. What this means is John Peck, when he sold the land to Fletcher, he was saying, look, I own this land free and clear. It is now yours. Well, because of what the Georgia legislature then turned around and did, no, he technically didn't own the land free and clear. And so that's what Fletcher is suing over. Right? The fact that the, there is there is a problem with the, the title, right? because technically now Fletcher would not own the land either. Well, in the ruling that comes down from the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court ruled uh, that this part of the Constitution called the Contracts Clause protects each party, each member who signs the contract. Whatever contract it is, we are talking about. And so, repealing the original land deal was unconstitutional because even though you had a corrupt legislature that had made the deal. The people on the other end who also signed the contract had not been consulted by the new legislature which had repealed it. And so you might think that this is a kind of a stretch, and perhaps it is, but this is an important court case uh, for two reasons. One, is this is the first time the Supreme Court declared a state law to be unconstitutional. And so the idea that uh, the Supreme Court is the highest court in the land not only for cases involving the federal government but also state governments, that's a big deal. The second thing is it helps to, to enshrine this idea that we call the sanctity of contracts. Once you sign a contract, it cannot be altered unless both parties agree. And that can be a good thing if you are the party who is getting a lot of benefit, and then the other side comes through and says, well, we want to change this deal because we're not getting the benefit, and we want to change it without your consent. They're unable to do that. Okay, so the sanctity of contracts thing uh, really is, in my opinion, uh, kind of the bigger precedent that's set here. All right, the other big domestic issue of Madison's first term in office involves the Bank of the United States. The Bank of the United States had been controversial since it was uh, established in 1791 under Hamilton's financial plan. Jefferson had maintained it, but now... Uh, its charter, or its contract with the government, is due to be renewed. So the government has to decide, do we want to keep this Bank of the United States, or do we want to get rid of it? Now, the Democratic Republicans are opposed to the Bank of the United States, and they oppose it for several reasons. First is, they felt that it was unconstitutional, that strict interpretation point of view of the Constitution. The Constitution doesn't say you can create a Bank of the United States, 
therefore you can't. But they also believe that it gave too much economic and political power to one bank. Okay. This is the bank that uh, will hold all of the government's funds, and so therefore it's going to have a lot of capital, a lot of money uh, in it, and for it to be the only financial institution that has access to those funds, they felt was unfair. They also felt that uh, since that's who the government was doing business with, it gave it too much influence over the government. Uh, they believed that the bank was dangerous politically because since the Democratic Republicans opposed the bank, it would make sense in an election for the bank to loan money not to the Democratic Republicans, but to the Federalists. And so if we look at elections, and one of the things that influences elections is money, the, whoever spends the, the most money generally wins an election, well, if the Federalists are the ones that are getting loans and able to spend more money, they will win elections. They will then enact policies that benefit the bank. And so the Democratic Republicans felt that, again, that, that goes back to the bank having too much power. They also don't like it because uh, it favored the wealthy. It favors the people that are bringing in uh, kind of that infant industry in the United States, it's not going to loan money to small farmers. Small farmers aren't going to borrow a lot of money, therefore they're not going to pay a whole lot back in interest. People that are trying to set up a, a industry, a factory, they will borrow away more money, they will therefore pay more in interest, they will therefore earn the bank more money. And since Hamilton wanted to create a nation that was based on industry and commerce, the bank, of course, is set up to, to help that particular sector of the industry. So with for all these reasons, the Republican-controlled Congress uh, refused to renew the charter of the bank. And even if they had passed that charter through and it had gotten to Madison, um, he may or may not have uh, vetoed it anyway. Now, Madison is also going to have trouble with Native Americans uh, who are going to be trying to block U.S. expansion. His particular troubles, his specific troubles, involve Native Americans living in the Old Northwest. That's going to be the Ohio, Indiana area. Several different tribes had formed an alliance in an attempt to stop U.S. expansion westward. So they're, they're starting to attack settlements, they, they're starting to attack uh, army units that are being sent out to deal with them. This particular alliance was led by two guys. The first one here is named Tecumseh. He was kind of the political slash military leader of the alliance. The other leader is his brother. Uh, this guy they called the prophet, and he was more of the spiritual leader. And so these two guys worked together to unite the different tribes. They believed that Native Americans uh, should not agree to sell land unless every single tribe agreed. It wasn't just a fact of this, is, this, is, this territory belongs to our tribe, and so our tribe must agree. It was your neighbors had to agree also. They're starting to figure out the way the United States was working. You go after one tribe, take them out, remove them, their neighbors won't support them, and then you go after another tribe, that divide and conquer idea. They've figured out what the United States is doing, and so they're trying to get everybody to work together. And they were extremely successful at it. The United, uh, the United States had sent uh, two different army units out west. Now, they didn't have a lot of men in them, but they'd sent these guys out west to go deal with the prophet and uh, Tecumseh, and they had been defeated both times. So in the fall of 1811, uh, two things are going to happen. First, Tecumseh is going to leave the Indiana area, and he's going to move south looking to expand the alliance. So he's heading down into uh, Kentucky, Tennessee area, looking to expand that alliance south uh, to try to block full U.S. expansion west, all, all the way from north to south. Unknown to him, at the same time, uh, 
William Henry Harrison, who we will hear more a little bit more uh, later in the course. He was governor of the Indiana Territory at this point, and he is going to lead an army of a thousand men out west to go try to stop Tecumseh and the Prophet's army and therefore stop the alliance that had been created. So while Tecumseh is gone, Harrison moves west, and Harrison is going to be involved in this thing called the Battle of Tippy Canoe in November of 1811, where he meets the Prophet's forces, and Harrison is successful. Harrison defeated the Prophet, and Harrison became known as the hero of Tippy Canoe because what ends up happening after he defeats the Prophet is Tecumseh's alliance starts to collapse. With his success, the tribes had been working together. Kind of, some of these were historic enemies, and they had been working together, and with success, that, that was not a problem. Once Harrison defeats the Prophet and uh, really shatters the Prophet's army, the alliance starts to fall apart as different tribes and, and their kind of historic rivalries start coming back up. And so the alliance ended up falling apart. Now in terms of foreign policy and what's going on with Madison, it really goes all the way back to the problems that we've been having with Britain and France, the problems that Jefferson had had. And Jefferson had tried to deal with those problems with the Embargo Act, where we refused to trade with anyone, and that was a complete disaster for us. Trade accounted for so much of the U.S. economy, and all of a sudden, uh, sailors were out of work, merchants were out of work, a, just a disaster for the U.S. economy. And so in order to try to get out of that, uh, we had replaced the Embargo Act with something in, that should say, 1809, uh, called the Non-Intercourse Act. The Non-Intercourse Act was basically like the Embargo Act, uh, except instead of saying we won't trade with anyone in the entire world, it said we would not trade with Britain or France. So we'll trade with anyone else, just not Britain or France. The problem with the Non-Intercourse Act is that Britain and France together made up still uh, so much of our trade. And the deal with the Non-Intercourse Act was that uh, we wouldn't trade with them until they stopped violating our rights. Stopping American ships, seizing American crews. And once they stopped doing that, then we would resume trade with them. Now, that went on for two years, and it still wasn't working. Uh, when you when you look at these two countries, I think they accounted for something like 80% of American trade, and so you're not getting your economy moving again. You're still not getting that sector of the economy going. So Congress drafted this thing called Macon's Bill Number 2. It's our way of trying to save face and get out of this disastrous uh, embargo idea, but at the same time convince Brit Britain and France to respect our rights as a neutral country. What Macon's Bill Number 2 said was that the United States would begin trading again with either Britain or France depending on whichever one of those countries uh, it says here they revoked their edicts. Okay? They stop violating our neutral rights. Okay? Those edicts uh, for Britain, it was the Orders in Council. For France, it was the Berlin and the Milan Decrees. So if one of those countries will end what they are doing, seizing American ships and cargoes, we will resume trading with them. The other country then would have three months to do the same thing, to, to revoke their edicts, and we would begin trading with them again. Otherwise, if they didn't do anything within the three months, uh, we would continue our Non-Intercourse Act with that country alone. The idea behind this was, if we put this offer out there, uh, either one, let's say France, France will say, okay, we will stop taking your, your ships. We would then begin trading with France, and we would say to Britain, okay, the clock is ticking. Do you want to continue trade with us? 
and get the same benefits as France, or do you want to have an embargo on American trade? Believing that, the British would say, well, we would much rather trade than not. The problem with Macon's Bill Number 2 ended up being how France interpreted it, or how France tried to get around it. See, Napoleon, who was in charge of France still, he agreed in principle to Macon's Bill Number 2, and he uh, said he would stop seizing U.S. ships, but only after we ended our embargo of France. So it's kind of the, the other way around. We're saying, stop taking our ships, and then we will trade with you. He's saying, trade with me, and then I'll stop taking your ships. And internationally, what Napoleon did is he also, uh, at the same time that he tells us this, he also orders American ships in French ports to be seized. Uh, he called it quarantine. And so there was some confusion as to what exactly he wanted. And what he really wanted was us to start trading with him without him having to say, yes, I have done what the United States wanted. He wanted to be the one that was on top. Now, it took us a while to figure out exactly what had happened. But in the meantime, before we figure out that he has uh, played us, uh, Madison agreed. Madison said that this was acceptance, obviously, of Macon's Bill Number 2, and the clock began running, waiting on Britain to turn around and remove their orders in council. Unfortunately for us, the British are going to respond by looking at this as an aggressive action of the United States. We are now trading with their enemies. And so they actually strengthened the orders in council, which allowed uh, the British Navy to seize American ships. Uh, they would send warships to... Uh, enforce a blockade of New York Harbor, and they also actively began uh, increasing uh, their actions regarding impressment, stopping U.S. ships and finding British citizens and forcing them off the ship into the British Navy. These things right here, uh, we'll talk about what they caused later on in class. I hope you enjoyed these notes. I hope they were short, and we will see you in class next time.